You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgvm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGVM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past. We're excited to have Rebecca Seguros and Matt Stern with us today. They're talking about their careers in archaeology, photography, and tea. Matt and Rebecca are married and living part-time in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and part-time in Boston. They're there, and Crystal and I are sitting here in the Extreme History headquarters. Matt and Rebecca are online via Zoom. And before we meet them, um, Crystal, tell us a little bit about your week. How was your last week? Because we're doing this on a Tuesday today. It's a little bit out of sorts. And we had all last week and then the weekend. So what's new? Well, we had a big week last week. We were um, part of an annual giving day that is kind of our local annual giving day called Give Big Gallatin Valley. And so I've talked about it on here before because we've been prepping for it for a while, which we usually do. And um, so it happened last Thursday and Friday, and we met our goal. We had a goal of um, raising $10,000, and we met that goal. So I was very and that's, excited. that's the first time you, yeah. you've had a goal set that high, right? $10,000. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so that's, that that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. So it was really good. And So where is, where is that money right now? Well, I don't, we, we don't have it. So. It's in the ether. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but that's going to really uh, help get us back into programming mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. doing a whole lot of wonderful things this summer with the walking tours and the lecture series and who knows what else, huh? Yeah, yeah. So it's Paying our it's going to really help us. You know, we use this fundraising amount for kind of our operations because we write a lot of grants, but grants don't always pay for operational support, like, you know, literally keeping the lights on. <laughs> so we yeah. have to fundraise, um, and, and a lot of that that operational expense comes from memberships, from memberships to the Extreme we History have great Project. members, yes, yeah, but we're always looking for more. Yep. Right, right, and, yep. and opportunities like this, like Give Big. So, so we were very excited about that, and we um, were so glad that, you know, the community came, really came out. And that's not just the local community, but really, you know, a wider community came out and really helped us with that fundraising goal. So we were thrilled. That's so, exciting. Yeah. What about you? Congratulations. Yeah. What about you, Nancy? Um, well, last week, getting ready for some spring stuff um, at the boutique at Mocha. And also my husband and daughter and I doing some planning for summer trips. Mm. So Ian is off to Columbia to do a photographic project there. Um, also, we're planning to go to Italy if everything is still open um, by then. We're both vaccinated, and we our plan is to fly into Bologna, see a bit of Florence and that region, and then hike six days in the Dolomites, mm, which are stunning. Cool. Yeah, hut to hut, mm-hmm. though, so that's going to be a little challenging. I've never done something like this backcountry in Europe before. Um, and apparently, though, I hear they have coffee in the morning and wine at night. So That's I think I'll be good. Right? right? Right. That's all. Yeah. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Meanwhile, my daughter will be in Greece doing a project through GVI for under 18 uh, students, and they will be monitoring and um, dealing with uh, turtles. I didn't know Greece along the coastline had their own mm-hmm. um, sea turtle population. So she's going to do that, and then I'll fly from Italy over to meet her, and we'll spend a few days on Santorini. So that oh, just fun. sounds dreamy. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah, I'm excited about that, but I'm also yeah. excited about a couple of things going on in the store. I noticed that not only is your bookstore almost up and running, but mm-hmm. you have some new things in your gift shop. And yeah. one of the things I'm very excited about are these new candles that Crystal has gotten in. 
Um, I love candles. We sell some in the boutique too, yeah. but this one says, um, it's called grandpa's cardigan is the name of the candle. And it smells like old world charm with a modern edge, apparently. And does it, it smell it like does. grandpa's it cardigan? Does. Well, and it has that undertone of mustiness. Um, yeah. <laughs> and old spice. <laughs> yes. And old spice. That was definitely what Shara picked up yeah, in there. Yeah. Um, and then you have another one that uh, is called vinyl records. It smells mm-hmm. like crackling nostalgia. And then a, a lovely um, mid-century modern it smells like clean lines and atomic sunburst. These are awesome. I know. So they're so fun. People, people are going to be just excited to get their hands on these once everyone's out and about again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our gift shop is really coming together and we've got some great earrings and historically themed, you know, items. And so it's so exciting. So yeah, we just got these candles in and I just love them. They're wonderful. Yeah. They're absolutely great. And they, and they smell amazing. Um, sometimes in spite of their titles. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, but before we get going, I, I have to ask Steve a question about his t-shirt. Um, it's K. BMF America's most radio. That's the logo. So Steve, we need you to tell us about this because you are a radio guy, but this is not the local radio station. That No, KBMF is a Butte uh, community radio station. Ah. So they were somewhat um, inspirational and helpful to us when we first got started with uh, uh, KGVM. And, and the Bozeman. t-shirt has this wonderful... So I bought the t-shirt to support their station. <laughs> uh, I don't... It's got like not a skull and crossbones, but a skull and radio waves and headphones. Emanating. Yes, yeah. awesome. It's, it actually feels very archaeologically themed uh, for yeah. today in a way. Yeah, I think they have sort of a gorilla radio uh, vibe to them. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you. Okay, Steve is our our technical guru and man of mystery. He's often in the corner learning Chinese while we're podcasting. So <laughs> I think over the next few weeks we'll be giving you a few more tidbits about Steve as we. As we delve into, um, I don't know, are we coming up on our 40th episode here? Um, what are we doing maybe. here? I'll maybe. I'll have to look and see, but we'll yeah, we're go. getting close. Okay. We're getting close. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, enough about us. Um, let's welcome um, Matt and Rebecca onto the Dirt on the Past. Welcome, you guys. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're excited to be here. This is uh, going to be an exciting podcast, and thanks again for bringing us in. Yeah, it's great to see you guys and to hear you as well. Um, I met you both at a Project Archaeology conference at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Cortez, Colorado. And I've been following your career. That was a, quite a while ago. I don't even know what year that was. Maybe 2014, 2013, 2012? I don't know. A while ago. <laughs> yeah. And I've been following your careers ever since, and I'm excited to tell listeners about your background. So I'm going to start with Matt. Matt is an archaeologist and photographer based between Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and Boston, Massachusetts. His work focuses on travel, nature, and cultural and environmental conservation. As a field scientist and photographer, he is interested in covering people's ancient and modern relationships with different environments. Both archaeology and photography have him um, traveling to far-flung places, and he is fascinated with covering local traditions and emerging emerging travel destinations, which we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Matt is a national fellow at the Explorers Club and has worked as the photographer in residence at the British School in Athens in Greece and as a senior photographer for archaeological projects on four continents. Matt is currently directing directing three high-elevation archaeological projects in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. He's widely published with articles in National Geographic, Smithsonian Magazine, BBC World News, Archaeology Magazine, Photos, Travel, and so much more. So welcome, Matt. It's great to have you here. And then Rebecca. Rebecca Segoros is an environmental archaeologist and also an educator. She is a freelance archaeologist focusing on projects in the Rocky Mountains, specifically in the Tetons, the Gravant, and Wind River ranges in Wyoming. Current projects include investigating life and food choices at high altitudes, paleo-environmental reconstruction of the Tetons, ice patch archaeology survey along the Continental Divide, and an ancient food and diet study using biomecular and experimental archaeology techniques. 
Rebecca also works on a Bronze Age site in Greece as a faunal analyst. You'll have to tell Kylie about that, Nancy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and on a Roman estate in Italy as a paleobotanist. I mean, you're going everywhere that <laughs> Rebecca works. I know. Maybe we'll run into her there. Yeah. We should have some wine one yeah. of these places for sure. Rebecca oh. is even more passionate about a community engagement and education than she is about research. I hear you, Rebecca. Mm-hmm. I'm right there with you. Yep. She co-directs a site at the base of the Tetons in southeast Idaho that brings public volunteers and school children out to participate in excavation and analysis. Rebecca has worked for several nonprofits and museums designing and teaching place-based archaeology programs, which is wonderful, and I love that work that you do, Rebecca. Um, She estimates that she has reached more than 2,500 students of all ages on local history and archaeology using hands-on programs. Rebecca found that the best part of her travels was the vast variety of teas and tea rituals that she discovered wherever she went. So she constantly collected these new teas and the things that went with them, the tea wearers, bringing them back to her family and friends. So with that, Rebecca founded a a company, an online company called Tea Hive in the spring of 2017 to share her passion for discovering high-quality, unique teas with others. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. So welcome, Rebecca. It's great to have you here as well. You you guys have a lot um, in your backgrounds to talk about, so this is going to be wonderful. Uh, Crystal and I both have uh, backgrounds in archaeology, and we've talked before on the podcast um, about the ways in which we became interested in learning about the world through archaeology, anthropology, and history. Um, so we're we're enamored with the ideas uh, that archaeology, the paths that it can lead us down, the ways that it can help us think about the world. Um, our, our present lives, the future, and um, we like to ask our guests. So we'll we'll start with you, Rebecca, and then get to you, Matt. But do you remember when you first decided uh, you were interested in archaeology? How you got interested in it? When that was? What was that like for you? I can't pinpoint an exact moment. You know, when the archaeology light bulb went on. But growing up in a Greek American family, we visited Greece annually. And I came face to face with ancient ruins and temples and stadia and museums everywhere I went. So it was really sort of infused into my childhood. Um, and I was always really sort of interested in the past. Um, we read a lot. I read a lot of historical fiction as a kid, mm. loved going to Renaissance fairs, living history museums. I really sort of wanted to be able to go back in time. Um, so when it came time to apply to colleges, it just sort of seemed like a good fit. Um, And then between history and archaeology, the option to travel and be outside and dig in the dirt, you know, archaeology sort of grabbed me. A little bit more out and in it than (laughs) perhaps being a historian that, you you know, you get to go to places to visit archives. But I think there is something about getting your hands on a lot of these these Um, objects or plant remains, whatever they may be. So, Matt, how about for you? My introduction to archaeology was a little bit serendipitous when I was 13 years old in middle school. the office of the Wyoming state archaeologist was excavating a, a 10,000 year old paleo Indian camp right across the street from school. Um, wow. And it was actually the night of my dad's birthday where my parents were out at a bar and ran into a group of archaeologists and oh, what a that. surprise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at the bar. At the bar. Yeah. Archaeologists at a bar. And they <laughs> explained what they were doing there. And my mom said, well, I have a kid who likes to dig in the, dig in the dirt. Can I drop him off for an afternoon? <laughs> uh, so they did. And that afternoon, turned into two weeks of volunteering, which turned into a a 20 year career, um, amazingly with the same people that I I met when I was 13. I still work with them today. Oh, that's amazing. I was Mm -hmm. immediately hooked with just the the passion that these people had for their work and their fascination with the past. And, and much like Rebecca, I quickly realized that it was an amazing way to, to not just see, but to truly understand different places around the world. And so it grabbed me, grabbed me quick and has never left. And it's funny because now we work in the same place where Matt grew up. And when we go to the middle schools to teach some of the same a- admin, remember Matt from when he was a middle schooler and he took time off to go do archaeology. So it's very like full circle. Full and- circle. I bet they love to see that. You've sort oh, of yeah. made good and you've, and you've been able to come yeah. home and bring that back. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. 
So often when you teach kids, sometimes you, you talk about the future, like when you become an archaeologist and that for them is like 20 years later, and it's kind of hard for them to make that connection. But here at the middle school, I can say, hey, when I was your age, right now is when I began my career. And, and mm-hmm. it often lights the fire, which is really neat to experience. That's yeah. so neat. That's wonderful. Wow. The That's the time to get them to that yeah. age. That's a great age to get them interested. Ugh. Yeah. You know, and, and Matt and Rebecca, many of us found ourselves interested in archaeology after watching Raiders of the Lost Ark at that age, you know, fourth grade for me, um, you know, and I know that my kids watched it about that time. It's It's funny. I think, you know, kids get interested in archaeology about that time. And it's that time that really hooks them in and and gets them interested in the past. Um, And, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark was exciting because it had that thrill of discovery in far off lands. It was really enthralling. Um, And then, you know, like you guys and like Nancy and I, we we were excited about archaeology. And then we went into the university to study archaeology and found out, well, it's not quite as exciting <laughs> as as Raiders of the Lost Ark portrayed it to be. But in, in, in reality, once we, you know, start studying archaeology, we find out it's much more intriguing in, in the ways that we learn about people who lived in the past. Um, but it seems like you both have been able to capture that Indiana Jones lifestyle and have the opportunity to really travel the world and investigate some of these fascinating archaeological and cultural sites. And Matt, you've recently done a project in the Sudan, the African country that is directly below Egypt. And of course, Egypt is an archaeological mecca, but we don't think of Sudan as having the archaeological merit that Egypt does. So can you just tell us a little bit about this project and what was surprising to you about what you learned about the cultural history of Sudan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was an absolutely wonderful trip. I, I took last year, weeks before the, the pandemic hit. Um, and much like my start in archaeology, this also began when I was in middle school. So it must have been a very formative t- time for me, and I realized it at the time. But I, I have this distinct memory of flipping through a history book and, and seeing a picture of pyramids that were not Egypt. Um, and it talked about pyramids in Sudan and the fact that there were more pyramids there than actually all of Egypt. It's just that nobody knows about it. And so going through my education and training as an archaeologist, I constantly had this dream of visiting and seeing these sites that I'd read about when I was younger, but I was always nervous. I mean, Sudan has a reputation that's that's preceded it. And it's not always um, a good one. But through some colleagues who who designed a new museum at the base of one of these pyramid sites, I had the chance to go last year Um, on assignment for a Smithsonian magazine to photograph and pursue a story about this this forgotten history of the Sudan. And it it was a a really amazing time. And we spent about three weeks traveling between various pyramid and tomb sites, um, photographing these UNESCO World Heritage sites that maybe receive two visitors a day um, in comparison to, say, Machu Picchu, which sees like three million a year. Um, and what was really fascinating is we were there a year after the revolution. And so uh, in 2019, the Sudanese people overthrew their dictator. And when they did this, when they went out into the streets and demanded him to, uh, to disappear, all of their rallying cries, their poetry, their costumes were all based on their ancient heritage. Mm. And so when I arrived in the country, I just expected to do this story about this kind of lost past. Right. But I found this community of people that just had this energy connected to their ancient heritage, bringing it back into the modern day to kind of define this new future in the country. And it was really something unlike I've seen anywhere in the world. It was it was truly incredible to witness it's like how sometimes as archaeologists, we struggle with making the past relevant to today. Um, right. But there are just and it was, it was really fascinating to, to witness. The um, photographs you took for that article are amazing, and it, like you, it's been one of those places that's been on my list ever since I heard about Nubian kingdoms and these these other things. And the first time I heard about it, it was as almost if it was an outpost or a place that Egyptians went and settled. And now we know so much more, and and that has changed our story. That this is an indigenous civilization developed in its own right and trade and exchange and ivory and gold and ebony and all sorts of things, slaves included, I think. Um, But Matt, I want to ask you a little bit about 
um, how you went from getting a degree in archaeology, you know, coming up through sort of learning field techniques right away first, you know, middle school, high school probably, then going to school and getting a degree. And now you have a career in which you um, publish a lot in magazines that are read, read widely by the public. National Geographic, Archaeology, Smithsonian. So it's a very different kind of publishing experience, I imagine, than um, an academic archaeology who's working to get tenure and publishing in American Antiquity and some other kinds of journals. So I was wondering if you can tell me how how you navigated that. Was that a conscious choice? And, and how something like that can happen? Because I imagine in, in some ways... To speak to your point about relevance, you know, you're reaching a much wider audience with your work this way, and and that's pretty fascinating for us to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so photography is something that I've always been interested in, even as I was um, working more through my academic path um, in, in archaeological research. And when I began to realize that I could make an impact through not just taking good pictures, but sharing stories to the general public was when people began to be more interested in the photographs I was coming back from the field with rather than the actual research. Um, and that, that's not to say we weren't doing good work, but um, I, I realized that the, these pictures and being able to translate the technical work we were doing into material that everyday people could understand and really appreciate was a valuable skill that I didn't realize that I possessed. Um, and, and around that same time, when we were we were publishing a fair amount of journal articles and book chapters, and, and our colleagues were doing the same thing, and I think both Rebecca and I had this not necessarily a realization, but kind of a complaint about how scientific information and, and archaeology, in particular, tends to be shared very widely within the academic circle, but not always so greatly outside. And Absolutely. so there is un yeah. unbelievable work being done in so many places, but very few people often get to know about it. And, and at that time, I, I did kind of make a conscious decision to begin publishing less of my own work and publishing less in academic venues um, and trying to concentrate more on sharing the, the work of other people and really looking for these amazing projects that were out there and ideally publishing them, them in places where people don't normally where the readers don't normally think about archaeology. And so, sure, in places like National Geographic and Smithsonian, obviously, archaeology is very big there, and it's a great way to, to share exciting work with huge audiences. But other venues like the BBC, for example, right, um, right. every time I, I get to publish a story there, I consider it a small victory because maybe I've gotten somebody interested in archaeology who previously hadn't thought much about it. Mm. And so it, it was kind of a... For me, it was a natural transition, but it, it was a very... Um, mindful one that I, I, I did on purpose. I think sometimes it's difficult when you're going down a career path um, as an academic to find the time to maybe reach out to or know who to access to get word about your uh, projects that you're doing, the research that you've done. Um, my parents used to read the New York Times religiously, and any time on this, the I think science is every Tuesday, and so I felt like almost once a month or once every two months, the science had something to do with archaeology, so I'd get a clipping in the mail. They would cut it out and send it to me if it had anything to do with archaeology or paleoanthropology. Thankfully, not dinosaurs. That was yeah. good. But it was, um, you know, it was a way for them to feel, you know, that they connected because it came, as you said, across something in, a, in a, um, a format that they were used to reading. And I think there are a lot of science writers out there who love being able to bring those stories. And those tend to be the ones, actually, that I assign in classes when I teach undergraduates is stuff done by science writers that's targeted that way because it's, it's not technical, but it pulls out the most interesting interesting things and sometimes does that better job about the relevancy. So um, I think I have a little bit of career envy, Matt, um, <laughs> but I haven't talked to Rebecca yet. So let's talk to her. Then so, you're really going to have I career. know. I worry about that because there's also tea involved somewhere down the line. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. So Rebecca, you've also done a lot of research as we've talked about where you're, you are doing, and I'm not so so sure how to say, is it paleoethnobotany or are you doing work on a much finer level where you're dealing with phytoliths and what are the actual, what's that? So I call myself a paleo 
a paleoenvironmentalist or a paleoenvironmental archaeologist. Most of what I study is um, food and diet, but we also link in that environmental context piece. Okay. Um, so, yeah, when I was in high school thinking about colleges and how to pursue a degree, I was sort of going between archaeology and culinary arts. Oh, wow. I was sort of one of the deaf, but um, I decided on archaeology. And over the years of my career, I sort of found a really handy way of bridging the two um, and getting the best of both worlds. So I did my master's at Sheffield University in paleoenvironmental and paleoeconomic studies. Um, and so we learned a lot of different techniques. Some of that is the faunal analysis. Some okay. of that is the paleo body. Okay. Um, just different techniques to reconstruct environment, diet, um, subsistence practices, agricultural um, behaviors. And I wrote my thesis on animal remains from a Bronze Age feasting site in northern Greece. Wow. Um, which was really cool because we could we could look at butcher marks on all the bones and start to make interpretations about uh, preferences and cooking styles. Were they roasting or were they grilling or were they right. stewing and boiling? The cuts that um, they won or don't want. I mean, it's so interesting to see those differences. I so so you then have a very broad base in what techniques you use. And I know some folks who are studying diet, they're also looking at human bone or or human remains on a molecular level or teeth just to, to look at sort of that chemistry, right? Do you, do you work with people who are doing that or do you do that as well? I don't do that personally. We've worked on various projects where that's going on. I mean, the thing is you're sort of tied to the types of clues you find at any given archeological site. So I feel like having a big arsenal of things that I'm aware of, things that I can do myself, um, techniques that you can sort of send out to a lab, but you know, like if I collect this sort of data, these are the answers I'm gonna get. Um, there's a lot of potential there to answer more questions. Um, a lot of the work we do now is in Wyoming and bones don't preserve that well there. So right. we've shifted focus mostly to um, lipid residue analysis. We have a lot of stone artifacts that do preserve um, soapstone bowls, cooking vessels, grinding stones, pottery vessels. Um, so we can use those to detect the foods that were cooked in there. Lots of ways um, to get at diet. And then as an extension of that also, I understand, you know, reconstructing the environment to know what resources were available and, and choices that humans had to make. I find that fascinating. But feasting, I feel like, is one of those things you must just come back. It's such a human universal, it seems like, that when there's periods of abundance or certain times of year, whether it's tied to religion or specific events, you know, life stage events, that must be quite a fascinating aspect of the work you do since you've worked in old world and new world sites. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, anytime we can, you know, hunt for a recipe or hunt for an, like a event or an activity, you feel like you're getting more specific, which is very rare when you're looking at really ancient time periods. So that's sort of a lot of what Matt and I do is trying to get more resolution. Um, so with the lipid residues right now, we have, you know, our results come back and it says something like, well, this bowl contained small fatty mammal and large herbivore and um, leafy greens and nuts. And what we really want to know is what was the small fatty mammal? Was it a marmot or a porcupine or a beaver? Or, you know, so we're working, that's where we're starting to do some experimental archaeology. Oh to man. So you're yeah. creating a stew in one of these bowls. <laughs> yes. Come on. Yes. Dang. Do you so really, we, do you really eat it? Do you use salt? I don't know. That would be rough. <laughs> <laughs> We've done some like paleo meals where we put together stuff. I, um, have had not had the great pleasure of eating Mormon crickets myself. Mormon <laughs> crickets wildly abundant in the mountains. Yeah. Matt and his crew fried them up with garlic, and I have heard that they taste like shrimp. But I am not quite brave enough to go to that route yet. But we do, you know, we are collecting animal samples and plant samples and boiling them down in replica bowls and sending them out to the lab to see if we can't get better. Fantastic! Um, yeah. Not better. So the experimental side of things, there's so much work to be done there, Rebecca. That's fascinating. But I have to ask you a quick question about the 17-year cicadas. Are they out there where you guys are? Are you are you in Jackson Hole or Boston? Oh, never mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's further east, right? And yeah. I wonder if those um, were a good meal. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Growing up in New Jersey, we had those 17-year cicadas. They're coming out again this year, I guess. Yeah. That's um, what I've heard. Yeah. I can imagine the they're 
they're a food source. All of the right? experimental work we were doing was a, a fun collaboration with the local game and fish department. So the stews we were cooking were mostly roadkill animals. Nice. That's why we didn't eat them. Okay. Wolf, black bear, bighorn sheep, elk, moose, all these things, but they'd been stewing on the side of the road for a little while. Ooh. So um, this was an outside project. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> <we're looking laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, want, like, we don't just because we assume that um, some people's wouldn't eat certain animals or plants doesn't mean that they didn't. So, like, I would love to get into test like sandhill crane. Like, were native right. people from, from eating crane, or were they eating raptors, or were they eating wool? I mean, some of these things that we don't consider food sources, we don't know until we've absolutely the one the one thing that amazed me when I, I started. Coming out west because I, I used to work in in Cyprus. I w- worked in Turkey a little bit in Morocco, and and I did some paleoethnobotany way back when. Um, but when I came out to Montana, reading about the bison that would die and fall into the Missouri River, and then mm. they would float down and they'd get bloated and they'd start to ferment a little. They they would turn a little green and putrid. And this was a delicacy. Mm. Am I right, Crystal? I've never remember? heard that. Nancy, yes, but that's you have, no, it's you've heard this. Steve's nodding. Thank you. Steve is yes, nodding. Yes, no, this is a thing, and it was supposed to be very tender and and again. So when you're talking about what people would consider a a food source, I mean, mm. roadkill is a perfect example of if if something's already dead, somewhat. How long you know it? You could do something to it, or it's it's good that way because it's already been processed a bit i don't know but the yeah, um i think the fermented bison you don't remember this I've i never, thought we had this I, conversation no, i don't think we have ever right. had this conversation wow. but i i've never heard that but that does not mean it i think it was when i was reading yeah. lewis and clark stuff i okay. think they start talking yeah. about it so all right okay. well if anybody's yeah. listening you can yeah. you can email us if i'm wrong about that <laughs> Google but, it. Yeah, yeah i'm sure i'm sure you're right nancy i'm sure um, you're right I, yeah. it's that i just hadn't heard that before that's an experimental project for a very brave person Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're going to rot and cook a bison. <laughs> right, right. I know experimental archaeology kind of scares me a little sometimes because it is, you know, you're kind of, you're going into, you know, uh, uncharted territory there. Yeah. But I think that's so interesting. And, and so you're putting, um, you're putting animal remains into this and then also nuts and plants and different things that you are seeing from the archaeological data that you're receiving back. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So so, um, so both of you do, along with all the other stuff we've talked about so far, you also do a lot of high-altitude archaeology work, especially when you're in Wyoming. Um, and you do, you know, and, and just to step back a bit, high-altitude archaeology is kind of a new field of study. It's only been around for about 15 years or so. Before that, we didn't really realize that people actually lived at high altitudes, above 10,000 feet. We thought that these spaces were too harsh to live in, and so archaeologists didn't really pay much attention to these places. But in the last 10, 15, 20 years, they've been noticing these places more frequently and really actively going to them to try to better understand how people lived in these high altitude areas. And so, um, and I know that you, you both have been doing a lot of work up in these high spaces and mountains, finding whole villages in these high altitude places. So can you tell us a little bit, either Rebecca or Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your work in these, in these high up places? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so if you remember back to what when the day I started archaeology as a 13-year-old, the, the person who took me into my first ever excavation unit was um, Dr. Rich Adams, and he's now at the University of Wyoming. And he really um, spearheaded a lot of the, the high elevation archaeology that's been done here in the state and really across the Western U.S. Um, and so when I was in college, he invited me to come back and work for his team shortly after he discovered a, a massive village called High Rise Village in, in the northern Wind River Range. And they, they discovered it while doing a survey. They had no clue that, that it was there, but it was a massive late prehistoric village located almost at 12,000 feet on a steep slope that would almost make a Black Diamond ski run. Wow. And it was... A, astonishing site they found i think 75 house pits that were dug out into the hillside each one had 10 to 20,000 artifacts in it it was perfectly preserved like you could see where a a woven basket once held ochre and stone bifaces so it was, it's an incredible site and it really changed how a lot of people 
uh, were, were thinking about the mountains. And so fast forward from high rise, when I was in college, I worked with, with Rich to develop a GIS predictive model to see if other villages like high rise might exist. Right. And, and because we, we discovered a smaller one um, a couple miles away. And interestingly, it was on the same exact environment as high rise. It's almost like they duplicated high rise village and pasted it on a mountain, um, just one, one and valley away. Describe for us what, what that environment was like, yeah. where you would yeah. then so find the large and the yeah, smaller one. 12,000 12, feet, typically 11 to 12,000 feet, um, high up on a mountain slope that receives a lot of sun and nestled amongst uh, ample white bark pine forest, an old white bark pine forest that we think would have been alive um, two to 3,000 years ago. Okay. And so we created a computer model to, to identify other areas in the winds that met these criteria. And with help, um, this was my first project for the Explorers Club, we, we got funding and we went out and looked. And lo and behold, we found not just one, but 20 more of these alpine villages scattered amongst the winds. And it's kind Amazing. of launched this, uh, this career. And, and it really is wild because you're right in that a lot of people weren't looking up high because for decades a lot of anthropologists who were say growing up and getting their education in cities and weren't familiar with the mountains looked up at these towering peaks and thought nobody in their right mind would live up there. Um, and, and they were wrong, which is great for us because there was this incredible and massive untapped landscape to do research. And for those of us, um, the, the team who we worked with for years were all people who grew up in mountain towns around Wyoming and Montana. And so it's kind of interesting that, when we went up there, it was it was just our backyard. That's what we were raised for. And so it was a lot easier to um, relate and explore in this landscape that people before us I just thought was too extreme. I will add that as an archaeologist who came from the East Coast city sort of life, my first backcountry high altitude trip almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> so I can understand how people thought it was harsh. I mean, if you're not familiar with the landscape and how to cross a river in early June when the water is raging and there are boulders and logs going by, you might get swept down the river or, you know, you don't know what a grizzly kill mound looks like. So you might just be hiking along it, not knowing that there are grizzly prints next to you. I mean, there's all sorts of things that like, I think native peoples were just so comfortable with. This was their backyard. They were very familiar with it. There's no reason to think they would never have been in the mountains. Um, only people who never saw a mountain before they came out to Wyoming <laughs> would have right. thought that. Right, but understanding the resources, I just wanted to ask a couple questions, talking about those couple of villages and then the other ones you found. You said they, they dug house pits out, so they, they sort of shallow pits um, – would have been sort of subsurface. And then did they have a superstructure that you were able to determine? Because you said there's so many artifacts. And, and so I also wanted to follow that up and ask if you're able to determine if it was year-round settlement up there, if there was seasonal movement down and up. Yeah, great questions. Um, so the, the house structures we call cut and fill lodge pads. And that's from the construction technique of cutting out a circular platform that's usually nine meters, or sorry, nine feet across and then building a retaining wall to fill down below to make the cut and fill structure. And we've actually been fortunate enough to, to find um, wooden wiki ups on top of some of these. Um, there was one that was, uh, we knew there was a wiki up there and then a forest fire came through and unfortunately destroyed the wooden wiki up. Oh, but, um, and for those of you who don't know, a wiki up is, is essentially a smaller version of like a wooden teepee. It's a conical shaped wooden structure. But when that fire came through, we found one of these cut and fill lodge pads directly beneath it, um, which wow. was direct evidence that um, they, they built these on top. But at high rise, um, at, at one lodge pad, we excavated down and actually found essentially a square log cabin wall. Like a um, crib structure. Yeah, so it looked okay. like they stacked it just like a historical log cabin. And the rest of it had been destroyed over the years. But we found a couple different types of these wooden wooden structures on top. And as far as how long they were there, I, I don't doubt that that the people living there, the Mountain Shoshone, could have spent the entire year up there. I, I think they probably had the know-how to, to pull it off, but I don't know if that means they necessarily did. Um, okay. We've since we worked in the winds, we've now expanded into the Teton Range, the Absoricas, the Grovant, and in one of the questions we've been toying with, and we'll talk about a little bit later in the podcast, is 
how can we nail down seasonality? How can we right. figure out exactly when they were there? Right. And we don't quite have those questions answered yet. Okay. That's Are these all south facing slopes, Matt? Southeast? Typically. Yeah. It, it depends on the topography. Um, you can run in, in the computer software, you can look at areas that receive the maximum amount of sunlight in a given day. Ah. And so times it's sunny south facing slopes, but depending on whether or not there's another mountain in the way, occasionally it's uh, north facing slopes. That's fascinating. So it, it, it yeah. Depends on the area. So your modeling really makes a difference there. And one more question: Is tree line? Are you are these above current modern day tree line, or are there trees now currently on these sites? It's a little bit both. So they're they're almost exactly at modern day tree line, but we have found villages almost a thousand feet above right. modern day tree line, and in this confused us for a while until we started to find what we called ghost forests near the, some of these villages. And they were essentially remnants of the, the past tree line. And so we know, we're, we'll talk a little bit about why we know this, but um, over the years we found out that tree line used to be a little bit higher during the late prehistoric period, so say two or 3,000 years ago. And so we always think that the villages were exactly at tree line, probably because it allowed a great view shed for hunting, but concealment so animals wouldn't see the people. So and then a resource. Time. Yeah. And and so um, I know Craig Lee has found in the Beartooths with the folks he's working with also some uh, sheep corrals and things like that. I don't know if you've also found those kinds of things. And this sort of gets into your area, Rebecca, with reconstructing a little bit more aspect of what that diet would have been like for folks living up there. Um, we do know there are sheep corrals in the mountain, in the different mountain ranges around the greater Yellowstone. Um, we, wood. Yeah, mainly wood ones. Um, it's sort of a preservation issue with forest fires and everything else. Um, yeah, we have, I think the ones that, that Craig Lee found are similar to what is, is seen in the Front Range in Colorado, these stone drive lines. And we have yet to find those in, in northwestern Wyoming at least in the areas we've worked, I'm sure they're there. But what we do find are these these wooden sheep traps, and it's neat. Um, Fremont County in Wyoming has the highest concentration of the oldest still standing wooden structures in the world. Wow. And essentially, there are these uh, these 700 to 800 year old uh, Shoshone bighorn sheep traps. Wow, and that's amazing. You can find some of the skull, the sheep skulls, um, like cached near the traps or like stuck into trees. Um, I know George Frizen found a lot of those. So, so they're a real, they were. a real basis for subsistence, um, oh. how people were surviving up yeah, there. Yeah, and something we forgot to mention about these villages is Rebecca um, alluded to the importance of white bark pine. Yeah. And one yeah. of the key components of they, they, these villages weren't just located in any forest. They were located amongst the highest producing white bark pine stands in the entire mountain range. And wow. um, some studies have been done that show that by weight, White bark pine is actually the fattiest food source available to prehistoric people, even more so than most meat. Really? And, and at the point, we find dozens and dozens and dozens of grinding stones, monos and matates, that oh, yeah. through the, the lipid residue analysis that Rebecca talked about, we've, we've shown that they were targeting these pine nuts um, to a huge extent. That must have been yeah, amazing. Really cool. I mean, yeah. One thing is the primary thing, gathering is the secondary thing. In this case, I'm without a doubt the caloric intake from these pine nuts was probably very important for their yearly consumption. And to be able to stay in one place, know when they're going to be ready, and then you can have the heavier equipment to grind it. You can afford to dig a house and stay. It just it just completely starts to change our understanding of of how people were living here long term in the northern plains and and up in the mountains. Um, I just think it's an exciting time for archaeology yeah. in in the Rocky Mountain area. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. You guys are are kind of at the the forefront of it, which is amazing as well. So we're going to take a quick station break. Um, you are listening to The Dirt on the Pass with co-hosts Nancy Mahoney and Crystal Alegria. Today we are speaking with Matt Stern and Rebecca Segoros about their multidisciplinary work in archaeology. And you are listening to KGVM.org. So um, we know 
that archaeology is a science. It's much more than a science, I think, too. Um, I think what draws us to it is it's a way to educate people. It, it, it can um, also be sort of almost a worldview, a way of understanding the world, but there's this process of discovery, and there's the scientific method part of it that really requires some rigor and um, the same standards you would, would hold any scientist to in any other discipline. So, Matt, you um, wrote in an article published in National Geographic that, quote, a professor once told me that interpreting archaeology was like reading a book without page numbers. All of the clues are there. It's just a matter of putting them in order, unquote. But he failed to mention that the book was in a foreign language and had been put through a shredder. Um, so we really love this quote because it it sums up the situation. So can you speak to that a little bit for people who are not archaeologists? Because that sounds exactly oh, that right sounds to so me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we, we've used this exact quote time and time again in our classes to young students. And you immediately see their eyes glaze over mm. when they realize that as archaeologists, we'll probably never know exactly what was going on in the past. Um, just because of the, the way evidence is presented and the limitations on, on what we can do with that evidence, we will always get as close as we can. We will use as many different techniques as we can, but we can only do so good. Um, and I know sometimes amongst ourselves and amongst colleagues, this can be an, an extremely large obstacle that, that sometimes people struggle with, but um, I think for myself and, and Rebecca included this, this knowingness that we kind of have this, not freedom of interpretation, but by trying as many different techniques as we can, you're not necessarily going to, going to get the wrong answer. It might not be the exact one, but we have this unbelievable ability to use our imaginations and creative problem solving to kind of treat archaeology like a, we always say like a crime scene. So like, like forensics, you don't, you, you walk upon it and there's all these bits and pieces of clues everywhere. And you just have to use your, your imagination really is, is what it comes down to, to figure out how to, how to just put them together into a pattern that you can recognize and then translate that pattern into something that's meaningful. Yeah, I think a lot of people like from the public do get sort of stum they stumble across that. How is it both a detailed scientific analysis based field and also there is a lot of this theoretical interpretation it's sort of hard for them to grasp we will give presentations to the public and some audience members just can't get past the fact that we can say something about people who were here eight thousand years ago who didn't have a writing and you know there aren't books to tell us what happened and they really get stuck on that but also on the other side of the coin frequently it's kids that do this to us where they'll hit you with some sort of question that they expect you to know because you're an archaeologist that you just have to be like completely open yet we can't answer that as archaeologists you know sometimes i have to be like you're right the art arrowhead we found on the ground here we're, we have to assume that it was left by the original owner we it could be possible that several generations of people have picked it up and moved it and used it and moved it out and you're totally right that, that could totally shift our interpretation of how this area was used or what these objects mean you know and these kids like look at you like well how can it be bogged? You know, like, can't, <laughs> can't it, yeah. right? and, and again, it's tricky. Like, you don't want to get bogged down in in that kind of the black hole of of not knowing in archaeology. But um, when I first heard that quote, I I loved it. It was almost like a challenge to me that, um, sure, that there's this impossible project ahead of you when you really think about it. But the the challenge of the the problem solving is just brilliant and wonderful mm -hmm. and. Um, I always tell, or a lot of people say I'm an oddity in archaeology where I'm, I love the past, but I'm not enamored with it. Like I can't spend days in museums like other people can, but the, um, the putting, putting together these clues and the problem solving aspects of it, I just, um, puzzle pieces. I, I can't wait yeah. to do the next one. Yeah, you know, and that's, to me, the exciting part of it, too, is that we never know what we'll learn tomorrow, you know, and that, to me, is so intriguing. Like you were saying, Rebecca, you know, we didn't know about this, the situation with the pine nuts, and now that we know that, that changes everything dramatically, and, you know, that happens every year when we're doing archaeology in different places or, or doing history in different different archives, you come across 
new information that changes the whole picture. And that's hard for some people because you think you have the story and then the story changes and that's, you know, disconcerting. But for me, that's what I love about it is that the story is always changing and it's always becoming more clear. And that's good science. I mean, yeah. I, I think for me, the science part of it is it helps you rule stuff out. Mm -hmm. We don't always ask all the right questions right away. Just when we were talking about the the Amazons, so the the Scythian and the Thracian mm -hmm. graves that held bodies with armor and horses, and then someone finally decided to test the DNA of those bones that they were presuming were men, and lo and behold, some of them are women. And so then all of a sudden it aligns with all these other historical stories and things that you can start to piece together. Uh, so I, I very much feel like there's... there's there's the scientific component that I rely on because it helps me say we can rule out some things when we hypothesis test. But without the storytelling aspect of it, um, I don't think it goes. For, and, and maybe for Matt, you storytell through your your photographs a lot. And, and Rebecca, maybe you storytell through reconstructing what it's like to subsist and, and feed yourself and your family in those places. And I, and I think that's sort of the, the most essential Thing in the basis for understanding a culture. Um, but unless you can throw your imagination in there, you use that word a lot, Matt, I think um, we lose the sense of what all this work is for. I mean, these are humans. We know there are certain things humans as a species need, but it's super fascinating to try to inhabit a little bit um, mentally of that space of what it would be like to construct a village at 12,000 feet and, you know, how, live there successfully. Um, Okay, so I just waxed on there okay. for a bit. Where are we yeah, at now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so you know the artifacts. So I want to get back to artifacts a little bit because artifacts, I feel like, is what brings people into archaeology, and that's kind of their first touch point when they're thinking about history, when they're thinking about people who lived in the past. When you see kind of a um, an artifact, you see a stone projectile point, or you see a piece of pottery, you can really visually. Um, link yourself back to the person who last held that or, or who used it originally or who made it. And so I think artifacts are interesting and, um, and visual, but there's so much more that we use as archaeologists to, to understand how people lived in the past. Um, you collect many different data, types of data, utilizing a wide range of disciplines, including chemistry, geology, climatology, and so much more. So can, can you both talk a little bit about the data you've collected, including artifacts, but, you know, all these other disciplinary um, things that you bring into your work to talk about the people and to better understand the people that lived in these high elevation villages? Yeah, um, I think Nancy really said this as well as in addition to finding these artifacts and interpreting what they were used for and what people were doing, something Rebecca and I really want to know about the mountains is what was it actually like to live there at different periods in time? What was it like to be in the High Tetons a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, at the very end of the Ice Age? And so in order to answer these questions, we realized that we had to draw on a most multidisciplinary team um, that, that possess skills beyond our knowledge base. And so we started this large collaboration with various scientists um, all over the, the Western US on, on our projects. And one of the more memorable ones was an environmental reconstruction project we did. Um, I think in the mountains of all places, just because the, the weather is so severe, what the climate is like really dictates what people do up there and how they live. And we wanted to get a really accurate understanding of what the climate was like at different periods in time for the Tetons. And so we, via horseback, um, carried in a pollen coring rig into the high Tetons. And it was probably the most dangerous thing we've ever done in the field, unbeknownst to us at the time, but it was October, it was snowy, it was icy, oh, no and we had to put this rig out in the middle of a lake and, and essentially drill down into the muck to extract pollen, which we could then work with a lab in California to help reconstruct not just the environment, but the temperature, the precipitation, what plants were there. And typically in a Wyoming lake um, in, in the northwestern Wyoming, you'll maybe get eight or 9,000 years, which was great. That, that would have been awesome. Um, but this lake was shallow. And we didn't expect to get past the archaic period, maybe 5,000 years ago. And so we were completely dumbfounded when 
we, we got to the very bottom and there was a layer of volcanic ash that we could accurately date. And it was 18 and a half thousand years old. Oh, nice. Wow. So we got this incredible record. But what was even more mind blowing was that the preservation from this lake was so good that um, say we got all the funding in the world. If we were able to sample this, this pollen core every centimeter, we would be able to get environmental data in 75 year increments. Which is okay, like, come on is people, like, pony up yeah. for this. We need to raise <laughs> yeah. money. That would be amazing. All right. No. We'll give you their emails after. Well, no, but that 75 year increments, really, wow. that would be possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in and, and doing this, like we were able to see when the first trees arrived in the Tetons after the end of the ice age. Um, we Ugh. were able to see when different edible foods first appeared. And and then fast forward 18,000 years, we were able to see from the sediment when the first hiking trails were introduced in, oh in the early 1900s. Wow. And, and with that, um, it really helped our understanding and, and interpretation of, of different archeological sites that we had found. And so we found these, these scatters of obsidian flakes, but now we had um, a stage, like a set, if you will, to place them on to start telling the story about what was going on. So with those obsidian flakes, we've been doing some obsidian sourcing. Um, what's really great about the greater Yellowstone area is that um, we can track movement and trade through the obsidian in the locations where these artifacts, the origin material comes from. So, you know, XRF analysis, this sort of fancy laser type situation that you bounce it off the artifact and what you get is a specific chemical signature that tells you it came from this volcanic source or that volcanic source. So we can say, we can look at different mountain ranges in our area and we can look for patterns across time periods. You know, at this site, they were almost exclusively using obsidian that came from Yellowstone or they were using it almost exclusively from Teton Pass. So we're looking at patterns there and seeing how people moved around the region. Wow. So you you actually, other than Obsidian Cliff, you have a couple of other sources that would have been candidates. So yeah. that's wonderful because then you can really track movement. We're, we have some areas of Montana where it's like Obsidian Cliff, Obsidian Cliff, Obsidian Cliff, and then a little bit of stuff from Idaho, you know, but it's... <laughs> There's some sources um, just on Teton Pass, uh, like t- the Teton Mountains themselves, sort of by Teton Pass where the road goes over mm-hmm. to Idaho mm-hmm. uh, and the Grove. Mm-hmm. has a source also. Did, mm. did you say Grovant? Um, um, mm-hmm, right? Yeah, yeah okay. they, they have one. There's a bunch around. And from all the work being done in Yellowstone, they've, they've gotten really um, specific signatures for these. And so our, like, our question was, we know what people were doing in the mountains, but they're only in the mountains for the, the minority of the year, only a few months when it's warm in the summer. So where were they going and what were they doing um, in, in, well, in a mountain town, we call it the off season, but <laughs> right, right. <laughs> when they, when they, um, in the um, but one of the other studies that we've done, which is one of Rebecca and my favorites, and we've talked about it a little bit already in this podcast is the, the lipid residue analysis. And we, we first caught onto this in graduate school in England because it's been done in broad age sites across uh, Asia and, and the UK for, for quite a while. And when we tried it here, we didn't know if it was going to work on surface artifacts, because typically when you look for absorbed fatty acids, fats and pots, they're from excavated contexts that have been preserved. But all we have here are broken pieces of rock and pots that have been sitting on the ground for thousands of years. But when we tested it, it worked beautifully. And we were able to extract, um, as Rebecca was saying, all of these different animals and plants that were being processed with these um, tools. And the single most exciting result we got in my mind was a soapstone bowl that had trout, white bark pine, leafy greens, marmot, and biscuit root in it. We're assuming marmot. It's a yeah, we're pretty sure it's marmot. Yeah. And we were reading an ethnographic study done on the, the Shoshone Bannock Reservation in the 1800s, and they recorded a recipe for Eastern Shoshone fish stew. Oh which was man! In, matched our findings ingredient for ingredient. Holy cow. And, like, and did you say trout? You said trout in there? Nice. Yeah. Do you ever find any wow. sturgeon or anything? We wonder. Um, there's a couple fish uh, samples that we have that are inconclusive for species, and mm. chemically they might match dried fish. Mm. And 
these are also at sites that through the obsidian sourcing, we've traced that the people were most likely going into central Idaho or eastern Idaho okay. um, during the winter. And so it's very possible that they were either, there could have been sturgeon or is, is ling, is that? I think yes, um, ling, like the, the long eel-like fish is another one that could have been dried and taken up into the mountains. Okay. That's amazing That's to see amazing. that connection between an actual recipe from, you know, back to an archaeological, you know, chemical analysis, a lipid residue analysis. Wow, that's pretty neat. And to get that yeah. kind of preservation. I mean, good for you guys for taking it and going for it and sending the samples in. Yeah. You know, um, who would who would have known if not, yeah. And the, yeah, the beauty, beauty of it was we were able to do it entirely non-destructively as well. Oh, um, good. The lab we worked with in Canada found a... a dental paper from the 1950s that described a way of analyzing like i think it was analyzing tooth pollution where they, they developed a non-destructive way for lipid residue and so we experimented with it on artifacts and, and it worked and so this was everything we do with this study we just can't say enough about it <laughs> that's amazing fantastic wow. Wow. yeah yeah so um both of you have done a lot with your careers uh working with the public and and giving the public opportunities to participate. Um, so, Rebecca, I just wanted to ask you in particular, what has made this such an important part of what you do with your career to find ways to engage the public, either specifically in the project in the field or in other ways? Yeah, I mean, public engagement is just absolutely crucial for archaeologists. I mean, I'm a firm believer that sharing information translates into a sense of duty for preservation, um, but also that you can involve people in the whole process. It's not just after the whole thing has its bow neatly tied up at the end that you can share the information. I mean, that's really important, but when we do actual live research with middle schoolers or we bring volunteers with us in the mountains, it's really just great feeling to sort of nerd out with people who aren't in your field about something that's so ancient. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's just so like, yeah, as I said before, it's important to get people to connect with their, particularly their local area, right? Place-based education is just such a vital way for people to learn and appreciate and become stewards and give back. And I mean, I think the last thing any archeologist wants, even though we love the personal sense of discovery doing research no one wants to just finish their research and send the materials off to some art repository and the data off to an archive and then have it never looked at again right mm -hmm. right exactly having it have ongoing meaning and i think having that that reverence for knowing the people who were there before who were able to make a living with so much less of the technology we have today and um hopefully people value these these places and spaces and and the descendants and you know the meaning that those things have so it's it seems to me like you bring all that full circle with that kind of outreach mm -hmm. yeah and it, it really helps with you know kind of that local place-based education that you were talking about rebecca too you know it really invests people in their place that they live and gives them mm -hmm. a sense of that identity of who who was here before, who's here now, and that, you know, this is, this is a shared history, this is a shared place. So I love that. And you guys do amazing work. I've seen photographs of your work um, on your Facebook pages of, of bringing kids out into the field and bringing volunteers out there on those long packed trains <laughs> of mules. And very brave. <laughs> very yeah. brave. Very I'm brave. just very brave, yeah. <laughs> um, so you guys are both so talented. We've talked about your, your um, talents um, already your, your multifaceted talents that you both have, but we haven't talked about your tea shop yet, um, Rebecca. So I want to talk about Tea Hive because you are an archaeologist extraordinaire, but that is not all. <laughs> you actually own an online tea, tea company as well called Tea Hive. So tell us a little bit about how that came about and what it is. Sure. Yeah, I developed a passion for tea through our travels as an archaeologist. I mean, every time we went somewhere new and different, I was collecting tea, tea wares, bringing them home with me. You know, the closet was quickly becoming too full. Um, but I just found that everybody thinks of tea as just being green tea, black tea, Earl Grey, chai, matcha maybe. Um, but there's so much more in the world of tea. Like every culture has their own 
traditional brews, usually herbal, not caffeinated plants, but some of them are. And the way they brew that is so steeped in their history um, that it's just really fascinating for me. And I wanted to share that with people who felt the way I do. I mean, like we've covered and shared all sorts of different plants like Kota, which is a, a plant that the tribes down in the Southwest drink. Um, we've talked about mountain tea in Greece, which is an herb that's sort of similar to chamomile. Um, that has a long, long history. Mm. Um, rooibos in South Africa, moringa yeah. in Ghana. Yeah. Nice. Um, juju leaf in China is a, a sort of an herbal tea, but tastes just like green tea. Um, Miao Pan in the southeastern you know, it's a caffeinated plant to grow wild in North America, which is sort of a interesting hmm. distinction. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so many different things I could talk about tea forever. Um, <laughs> but many, you know, they have deep roots. Like a lot of these people have been drinking, these cultures have had these teas in their history for hundreds or thousands of years. And you can also see tea culture evolving even today. I mean, on the East Coast is growing popularity for seaweed tea because in Maine and other coastal Atlantic states, lobster fishermen need another sustainable agricultural product to, to collect and harvest. So they're collecting seaweed and making tea out of it, which is sort of a fascinating that is. new development. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And the cultural ties to tea are huge. huge. I mean, yeah, like you yeah. said, I, I think that's what a, what a perfect combination between what you do as a, an archaeologist and cultural, cultural anthropologist and tea. I mean, that's such a huge connection there. So that's, so, th so how does your tea company work, Rebecca? Like, the Tea Hive is a well, primarily it's a subscription box. So we do monthly themed boxes that go out, um, and we, you know, three teas and a, something that pairs with the tea. It might be a honey or a teaspoon or something like that. And you get a card that tells you all about the theme and the history of the teas and where they come from. And all of our partners that produce tea for us just do great environmental and social work so they give back in other ways we want to support small growers um, people in countries where they're you know building schools or helping their rural communities or these you know the tea companies run by women or you know different little right that's wonderful ways of, yeah and I have to say that I ordered um I ordered the November box and it was wonderful and it came um, you know, November and you had a card in there talking about how, you know, in November you're it, it's time for Thanksgiving and you need a digestive tea. So one of them was a digestive tea and so it was they were all wonderful. All three were just wonderful and I so enjoyed them and so did my daughter. She loves tea too. So we we geeked out on your tea. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So it was so much. It was so fun to get that box in the mail, though, too. And I love that. So, so, um, so that was great. Well, you guys, it has been incredibly wonderful to have you on. It's been such a fascinating conversation, taking many turns. Um, so we're so glad that we could get you to join us today because I know we did try this earlier. So second time yeah. around was the charm, yeah, which is great. And. Um, and so if listeners want to learn more about both of your work, we wondered um, if you could tell them where they could find more information about you and what you do. Sure. Um, the best place for me is my website, which is mattsternphoto.com. Um, and we, we share aspects of both our, our research and uh, my, my photography and journalism work on there. Great. Yeah. If you're interested in tea, it's myteahive.com. If you're interested in public archaeology, engagement, outreach stuff, I guess you could email either Matt or I. Would, would you like us to give you our email? You can find it on, yeah. on either website. It's either on website, you should be able to get to an email okay. contact list. Great, and we'll, we'll make those links available. Yeah, so, so thank you both so much for joining us today. It's been great to have you on and get to visit with you and get to talk with you a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks to both of you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. If you're enjoying The Dirt on the Past, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Also, please tell your friends and leave us a review. It really helps people find us. We're a new podcast and we're trying to grow our listener base, so please share. Thanks, and make sure to keep searching out The, the Dirt, Dirt on, on the, the past. past. Thanks for listening. And if you're enjoying The Dirt on the Past, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Also, please tell your friends and leave us a review. It really helps people find us. We're a new podcast, and we're trying to grow our listener base, so please share. Thanks, and thanks for listening.
You've been listening to The Dirt on the Past, a podcast of the Extreme History Project and Gallatin Valley Community Radio, KGVM. To hear more episodes, visit our website at theextremehistoryproject.org. Thanks for listening, and until next time, keep searching out The Dirt on the Past.